Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 American Society for Bioethics and Humanities meeting. I'm Toby Schoenfeld, president of ASBH, and I am so pleased to join you for a week of exciting presentations, collaborations with colleagues old and new, and hopefully I hear some delicious toasted ravioli in honor of our host city, which apparently is a St. Louis thing. We'll have to check it out. St. Louis, of course, most famous for its gateway arch, uh, connecting the West with the East. On the board, we do a lot of thinking about what makes ASBH unique and how it differs from other organizations. What we've landed on is the and for bioethics and humanities. We connect scholars and professionals from so many fields and invite them to learn from each other. Let this conference serve as a gateway for you to learn from someone whose background is completely different from your own, a gateway to explore new technologies and ways of thinking. And if you decide to visit the actual Gateway Arch, I hear that the view from the top is wonderful. I will not be joining you, heights are not my thing. I encourage all of you to explore all of the history and culture St. Louis has to offer. Many of the city's museums are free, and you can find a list of some of the local events and attractions on the ASBH conference app. The app is the home to the most up-to-date version of the conference schedule, room locations, and more. You can add sessions to your personal itinerary, connect with our exhibitors and supporters, and find the best places to eat in Union Station. Some of you may have noticed that this is the first year without our standard program books. Well, the few of you that read them, anyway. We promise to you all of the information you need to navigate the conference has been added to the app and the ASBH website. You can also use the app to access conference evaluations. As you attend sessions throughout the week, we invite you to complete conference evaluations whether or not you intend to complete or, excuse me, you intend to claim continuing education credit. You can share your thoughts and find additional instructions on the ASBH website and in our daily conference e-blasts. I promise you, our evaluations data are the first thing the program committee reviews as it starts its deliberations for the upcoming year. Your feedback is critical in shaping future ASBH conference programming, the resources we offer attendees, and other educational opportunities. And I personally am very excited that we have now the ability on the app to evaluate each session at the end of the session. So don't wait till the end of the day when you've forgotten because you've seen a number of amazing things. Do it at the end of the session before you walk out of the room. We do hope though that you enjoy this year's programming slate. The program committee worked tirelessly to put together over 400 concurrent sessions in addition to our plenaries, enrichment hubs, affinity group meetings, and networking opportunities. Thank you to everyone that will be presenting this week for sharing your expertise with us, and thank you to everyone that submitted or reviewed this year's batch of proposals. Our conference is built on the hard work of our members and volunteers, and I'm excited to experience the fruits of your labor this week by learning new methodologies, engaging in vital conversations, and connecting with new members of the community. One of the best ways to make these new connections or strike up a conversation with an old friend is our networking hall. Here, you'll find professional opportunities to connect with potential employers or collaborators and opportunities to take a break, grab a coffee or some breakfast, or even play some games. And this year, you even have natural light, right, in the networking hall. After this session, we invite you to join us for our third annual opening luncheon, generously supported by the Institute for Bioethics and Health Humanities at the University of Texas Medical Branch. As you enjoy some lunch and music, I challenge you to strike up a conversation with someone new. The person asking to join your table could be your next colleague, mentor, or friend. In addition to UTMB, we want to thank all of our conference supporters and exhibitors for their continued support of ASBH 
and the annual conference. Your generous support is greatly appreciated and helps us provide a high quality meeting for the community. Now, before we all start thinking a little too hard about lunch, we have a very special session for you. Neural Net Aesthetics, featuring Aileen Isagon Skyers. Ms. Skyers is a distinguished writer, artist, and curator with practice and criticism focused on digital art and culture. With a dynamic academic background that includes a master's degree in critical theory and creative research, and studies across both studio art and philosophy, Skyers brings a rich interdisciplinary perspective to her curatorial practice. Deeply engaged with the implications of AI in art, Skyers explores how machine learning and artificial intelligence can be harnessed creatively and ethically. In 2023, she presented a TED Talk titled, In the Age of AI Art, What Can Originality Look Like? Through her work, she has worked with contemporary art and nonprofit arts organizations, including the Whitney Museum, Rhizome, David's Werner, Frame Contemporary Art Finland, and Pika. Her first book, Vanishing Acts, was published in 2015. In this session, Ms. Skyers will delve into the innovative work of artists making use of AI technologies to expand the bounds of creativity. AI data sets are not neutral tools, but rather repositories coded with the bias of those who create them. This session will explore the ways that art can be used to bear witness to a transformational moment in history and the active role it places in world building. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Skyers. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the warm welcome. Are we ready to look at some art? In this presentation, I plan to delve into the innovative work of a number of artists who are using AI in their practices in novel ways to both challenge and expand the boundaries of creativity. This is a bit of an extension of a presentation I gave last year at the New Museum in New York as part of a series of panels that Rhizome has organized called Net Aesthetics. As a jumping off point, I was prompted to consider Ted Chang's idea of AI as a compression technology. Compression and replication have long been integral aspects of creative practice, long before the rise of AI. Much of today's presentation will cover how, while these processes can perpetuate harmful and oppressive systems when misused, they also offer the potential for empowerment and artistic expression, and even the imagining of speculative futures when employed more thoughtfully and more critically. In my recent TED presentation covering art in the age of artificial intelligence, the thesis I aimed to get across was this idea that AI can actually extend the creative capabilities of artists rather than hinder or threaten them. However, I also stress how, contrary to popular belief, it can actually require much more work, more intentionality, more ingenuity to create with machine intelligence and result in artworks that feel wholly original. Artists have been leveraging new iterations of emergent technology for centuries. During the Renaissance, the camera obscura was a vital tool for artists who wanted to create more realistic, three-dimensional representations of the world on a 2D plane. However, given its capacity to transform and evolve over time, AI introduces new moral, aesthetic, and epistemological outcomes. These outcomes of machine learning are both material and conceptual. They will shift our conception of time, history, creativity, and aesthetics. 
Of course, the history of AI and the philosophy of technology are both long and intertwined. We've been dealing with these epistemological considerations of what constitutes intelligence for ages, from Leibniz to Turing to now. And when we think about what intelligence is, the presumption is that human intelligence is not just the central intelligence, but indeed the norm. Our present day AI appears to us as almost human by replicating human thought and interaction. But to idealize what appears to us as most human in AI, namely solipsistic commands and responses, is to take for granted our understanding of what machine intelligence actually is. Different tools make different ideas possible. Large-scale computation is certainly transforming the way that the world works. It is, as Benjamin Bratton has said, an accidental megastructure that shifts politics, economics, and culture in its own image. The capacity for AI to present itself according to human social cues is remarkable. AI anthropomorphism offers an easy way out. In many representations of AI that we are familiar with today, it appears almost human. A chatbot, an assistant, a tutor. The more that AI complements human interaction, the more easily it can be integrated into human culture. As we know, one prevailing line of thought in AI ethics insists that AI is simply a mirror to human society. It reflects the unjust biases and inequalities of the systems that produced it. I will not belabor this point about the stereotyping and biases embedded within artificial intelligence and how frequently the machine's decisions can potentially create deeper structural inequalities. But I will note how these decisions and their outcomes now have profound effects on our material lives. It can affect who has access to jobs, healthcare, homes, and insurance. Perhaps instead of rigidly aligning AI with human values and engaging in superficial anthropocentrism, guiding AI may well require a nuanced skepticism toward human-centric perspectives in order to acknowledge a broader range of possibilities. In other words, we stand at a significant crossroads. AI uniquely poses both existential risks and remarkable opportunities. It is both a mirror and potential transcendent force in our society. It reflects the values, virtues, and flaws of the cultures that created it. But at the same time, it also extends beyond mere cultural reflection offering profound potential that exceeds human scale ideas, culture, and economics. It is important to note that AI only partially overlaps with human systems. It is indifferent to them. That said, we must confront a pressing question. Should AI be strictly governed by human-centered norms, or is there room for a more expansive vision that recognizes its potential to redefine what thinking, creativity, and problem solving can be. Perhaps we ought to rethink our very engagement with AI, exploring how it can extend human cognitive, intuitive, and creative capacities in ways that challenge our current bounds of understanding. And in so doing, we might look to the work of artists who provide apt metaphors that allow us to visualize and grapple with this impending future. So, what does it mean for artists to work with a tool that not only extends their capabilities, but that also has the potential to shape and inform their creations? And how do we begin to critically evaluate images that have been informed by data processed from millions of other images, art movements, and contexts 
within the space of a single second. As we increasingly progress towards the automation of all aesthetic decisions, from algorithms suggesting what we read, wear, listen to, to devices and services that automatically adjust media to fit within its criteria, to software that perhaps rates the aesthetic quality of our own photos and memories. We are all going to be bound up and implicated in the consequences of AI. Some might say we already are. So I feel that the better we understand these systems, the better we can embed this multiplicity of competing values into how we co-determine and understand creativity in our imminent future. I would now like to introduce a short film called Anna Min Win by new media artist Nuf Aljawasir. This visual diary follows an AI assistant as it attempts to support her journey to learn more about her heritage, only to discover the limitations and stereotypes ingrained within machine learning. Anna Minwen. Where are you from? I don't know where I'm from. Part of me is from Saudi Arabia, where I was born, and where I lived for 13 years. But another part of me is from the US where I immigrated to and have been living since then. How can I help you? I guess I want to remember where I'm from. For so many years, I pushed this part of me down, pushed it away so that I can fit in. Now that I'm older, I'm tired of doing this. I want to reconnect and remember the Adhan playing every morning five times a day. I found a castle made of wood. 95.4% accuracy rate. Is this where you are from? Why do I live in a world that doesn't see me? Why do the forces that kept me hiding who I am persist today? We don't have castles in my culture. Traditionally, our houses were built from mud, as it helps heat and cool during the harsh desert weather. I remember visiting these old buildings with my dad. We'd go to the park and walk around. You would see a sea of black and white. That's how it was back home. Women wearing abayas and men wearing white thobes and checkered pink and black schmaltz. I see women wearing hats. I'm detecting men wearing dresses. Men with turbans. Men with cloaks sitting in a garden. Is this where you are from? My father wore a shmar, not a turban. I remember always admiring its elegance. The way that men would adjust it on their heads as if it were beautiful long hair. The way that they delicately folded it to frame their face. Putting on a shmar represented tradition, elegance, and power. I don't recognize this word, shag. Schmack? When I was 13 years old, I moved to America to get a better education. 
I moved to a place where no one looked like me. It was hard fitting in. I remember hearing Americans always being confused and thinking I'm Indian or Hispanic, that I didn't look Arab. Maybe it was because I didn't wear my hijab. What was I supposed to look like then? What do you expect me to look like? I've detected a tent in nature. My results indicate northeastern United States. Is this where you are from? Virginia was not home. I felt like an alien, an intruder. Every night, I would lay down in my dorm room and remember what was previously home. I would feel the distance that I created, replaying my childhood, my old school, the old uniform I used to wear, and my old routines. As I grew older in America, I felt that distance from home increasing and this deep hole getting bigger and bigger. Calibrating? Where are you from? And I'm in Wynn. Part of me feels like I'm not from one specific place, that I'm fragmented from different pieces. I'm from Basra, where my mom grew up. I'm from Baghdad, where my grandmother was born. Iraq has always held a special place in my heart. My mom's stories were so beautiful and vivid, I wanted anything to go back and be a part of it. Iraq. I found pictures of Iraq. Is this where you are from? Iraq was never like this. My Iraq is different. My perception and memories of it are different. Mama, tell me about Basra. احنا بيتنا كان في البصرة على شط العرب شط العرب هو التقاء نهر دجلة والفرات كان المنظر جدا جميل ما هو واسع يعني تشوفين الطرف الآخر من من المنطقة الثانية اللي اسمها التنومة وانت من الطرف اللي في بيتنا وكان حتى غرفتي يطل على شط العرب من أفتح الستارة I can see شط العرب من غرفتي حديقة بيتنا كان تشوفين فيها كل أنواع الورود تسمعين كل العصافير تلاقين فيها العنب ما نشتري من السوق لأن العنب كله مغطي الحديقة الموز مرات يطلع مو دائما مرات حتى مانجا مرات توت التين كان بكثرة يطلع فالورد كنا ما في ما نشتري ورد نقص الورد ونحطه بالحديقة بالبيت بالمزهرية أو البازة. According to my search results, Iraq is classified as level four travel risk due to terrorism, kidnapping, armed conflict, and civil unrest. Is this where you are from? أول البصرة كانت مفتوحة جدا مفتوحة يعني أحدث الأفلام تجي كان فيها سينمات فيها نادي فيها كل يعني المدارس حتى في مدارس مختلطة في مدارس لا بنات أنا كنت في مدرسة الابتدائي كانت مختلطة وبعدين رحت إلى مدرسة المتوسط والثاني وكانت بنات سينما مصرية هي مسيطرة تتكلم عن عن حياتنا عن الطبيعة كمسلمين كمحافظين يعني لنا نوع من الكلتشر الخاصة فينا في أفلام مصرية قوية حقت فاتن حمامة حقت سعاد حسني ذلك كانوا كانوا ممثلين بالمرة يعني معروفين وأفلامهم مو مثل الحين أكثر الأفلام اللي تنزل أو المسلسلات تعالج مشاكل مرات من تشوفينها بالتلفزيون تحسين هذه مشكلتك أو موجودة عندك في البيت أو موجودة عندك في حياتك فتنجذبين لها ماما ليش تركتي عراق؟ حنا أساسا من نجد 
بس ذاك الوقت كانت فقيرة نشت وما فيها أي يعني قبل لا يطلع النفط ويبون يعيشون فجدي طلع و... وكانوا أكثر الناس أهل نجد علشان يعيشون يطلعون ويروحون أما يروحون للعراق أو يروحون للسورية فكان أكثرهم بين العراق وبين سوريا إحنا طلعوا راحوا إلى الزبير يعني سبحان الله الزبير هي جزء اللي تشوفينها كأنها جزء من نجد صحراء ما فيها خضرة ما فيها شيء وعاشوا هناك فكانت كوميونتي كبيرة من من أهل نجد هناك وحتى تزاوجوا بين بعض وألفة كبيرة وحتى من قام يصير عندهم زي ما يقولون التجارة دخلوا بالتجارة وحالتهم صارت طيبة هم كانوا كما مع بعض يتشاركون يعني ما يطلعون برا عاد بعدين من بدأوا يشترون بيوت بالبصرة وبدأوا ينقلون على أساس هناك أكثر وكانت البصرة هي عين المنطقة يعني كان حتى الكويت والكويت يعني نوعا ما مفتوحة كثير من العوائل تدرس بناتها بالبصرة يعني ما كان في مدارس ويجون يسكنون بالبصرة وكان رايحين جايين بسبب قرب المسافة من تحسنت الأمور في المملكة و وساءت الأمور بالعراق بدأوا الناس ترجع Saving new information. Your mother is from Basra. You are not from Iraq. You are not from the United States. You are not from the Middle East. I don't know how I can help you. I don't know where you are from. Anna Minwin. This question has been very hard for me to answer. Is there one word or place that defines my identity? Is my lived experience summarized into an image or a piece of clothing? I am from the flowers that bloomed in my mother's garden in Basra. I'm from the rivers of Tigris and Euphrates, where my mom crossed every single day to school. I am from the dark black abayas of Saudi Arabia, the checkered pink and white shemaks of Riyadh. I'm from the smell of incense coming into the house. I speak Arabic with Iraqi and Saudi tones. I speak English with an American accent. I'm from the woods of Virginia, the grapes of Iraq. Ana min wain? My mom always said, Ana bint al arf. Nuf Al-Jawasir's Anamin Wen, Where Am I From, is a very powerful depiction of how data layers the past into the present in intricate and complex ways. It represents the portrait of a young person searching for a sense of identity as they see themselves reflected or not reflected through generative AI's lens. And I believe that this kind of process is going to become a far more frequent part of how we come to understand ourselves, our histories, and our identities as we increasingly find ourselves in conversation with AI. Artists like Stephanie Dinkins and Morishin Alayari also point to the distinction that these AI datasets are not neutral. Rather, they are coded with the biases of those who create them, thus becoming vehicles for certain narratives over others. In the historical arc of artists working with net art, code-based art, and digital media, we have often seen how limitations can serve as a fertile ground for creativity. Net artists and code artists have often embraced lo-fi aesthetics or old computing processes to subvert or critique new technologies. 
seemingly the teleology of the technology and the engineering behind it always seeks to improve image quality, making it more hyper-real or more seamless. But this takes for granted how we betray or dismiss techniques, effects honed by artists for hours in earlier models. With AI, intentionally producing smaller archives or pulling local data sets can begin to look like an act of resistance of the technology itself. Artist Stephanie Dinkins uses AI to create databases and narratives that center the experiences of marginalized communities, essentially reshaping what gets preserved. Dinkins' Not the Only One NTOO artwork, which began in 2018, is a long-term exploration of artificial intelligence and human-machine interaction, a deep learning algorithm programmed with small data from the artist herself. In an attempt to create a voice interactive entity like Siri or Alexa, Dinkins trained her AI on oral histories from three generations from women in her family, each about 30 years apart. They asked one another deeply personal questions and recorded the answers, essentially creating an archive of their own lives. The resulting data set encompasses a multi-generational memoir, which the artist has enclosed within a sculpture shaped like a three-headed vessel. Dinkins invites viewers to lower their heads and ask questions to the vessel and receive responses from the AI in first person as a unique character whose strained oration comes from the cognitive dissonance of being trained with a limited data set. Rather than share straightforward answers about the artist's family, the AI analyzes and holds on to their ethos to manifest its own conversation. The work represents an ever-evolving artificially intelligent narrative form, one that quietly subverts or reveals some of the absences inherent in big data. One odd fact about much algorithmically generated art is that while it operates within this rhetoric of sheer hyper-reality, it is informed by data sets derived from centuries of the Western art historical canon. In effect, AI-driven imagery inherits both the coloniality of Western art history and that of artificial intelligence as a technological field. Morishin Alayari, a New York-based Iranian Kurdish artist, attunes us to markedly different algorithmically generated visions, dealing with cultural preservation in the face of loss.
The artist's series, Moon Faced, uses an AI model trained on Kejar Dynasty portraiture to paint genderless portraits and recover queer forms of representation that precede the influence of European visual culture. The artist uses a carefully researched and chosen series of keywords with a multimodal AI model to generate these videos using the Kejar Dynasty painting archive. Through this collaboration, the machine program effectively learns to paint new genderless portraits that reimagine history. Many artists working with AI today are not only critics or observers who bear witness to this particular moment in history, but they are also active participants in world building and figuring in reshaping or reimagining alternative futures. Amelia Winger Bearskin applies a multidisciplinary lens to her AI-based artwork, which often interrogates the supposed neutrality of technology and strives to imbue AI with values and narratives from her own indigenous culture. Her ongoing series, Sky World, Cloud World is concerned with the theme of communication networks in the sky, questioning laws that treat airspace as a territory or extension of land, and geographic information systems whose satellites we can see from Earth. The artist seeks to understand the cloud as a spiritual place and vehicle for communication with ancestors over distance and time. The series demonstrates the potential for AI to be used as a collaborative tool, one that can be harnessed for more imaginative ends. The film, I Would Like to Be Midnight, I Would Like to Be Sky, is one that the artist has shown at film festivals around the nation. And we are fortunate to see just a short excerpt of that today. Part of her Sky World, Cloud World series, this film uses in-painting, a technique traditionally used to reconstruct the missing regions in an image to erase the human architecture within personal footage she's captured. She also uses digital image interpolation when an image is resized or distorted, giving the film this liquid morphing quality. The artist Ian Chang uses AI and other technologies to create real-time evolving simulations, offering viewers a chance to immerse themselves in his algorithmically driven storytelling. Life After Bob, Bag of Beliefs, is Chang's ongoing series of videos about artificial life forms. It centers a protagonist who has an experimental AI named Bob inserted into her nervous system by her neural engineer father. Built in the Unity gaming engine, 
It imagines a future world in which AI entities co-inhabit human minds. The series explores mutation, human consciousness, and our capacity as a species to relate to change. Cheng has now generated enough complexity out of his AI mythologies to produce environments filled with components and new characters in a process that he calls worlding. Not only fleshing out the territory of place, character, and backstory as a fiction writer would, but going one step further to create an actual narrative that people can inhabit. He has said that the holy grail in storytelling would be if he could start the story as an author and then have AI complete it in a meaningful way. Future installments of this series will become even more AI driven to the extent that each retelling of the story may emerge differently in both narrative and aesthetic. Sophia Crespo's series, Neural Zoo, uses neural network interpretations of the real world to generate unreal sea creatures and diverse biological life forms. What at first appears to our cortex like a very convincing image of a biological ecosystem is quickly revealed to be an entirely impossible rendering. Frogs look like flowers. Translucent jellyfish have vivid internal organs. Her work combines neural networks with images of the natural world to generate what she calls a speculative nature. What is interesting to me is that despite all of the ways that we try to make artificial intelligence reflect human intelligence, AI continues to confound. Perhaps the conversation should be reframed. It is less about us teaching machines how to think and more about machines teaching us. One of the most impactful revelations that has come from researching AI is that thinking as an activity or state is perhaps far more expansive and diverse a phenomenon than we previously understood it to be. Curator and writer Nora Khan has aptly used the metaphor of a hurricane to describe an impending artificial superintelligence, or ASI. When it is all around you, you can't see its eye or sense its danger. It is a machinic mind with infinite cognitive memory and processing ability that can only be tracked and traced, never controlled. To share a brief excerpt from Khan's essay, toward a poetics of artificial superintelligence. <clears throat> Hurricanes, star systems, for me an image of intelligence with such primordial divine force, sunk in deeper than any highly technical description of computation would. Not only does an image of ASI like a hurricane cut to the center of one's fear receptors, it also makes the imaginings that we have come up with and continue to circulate, like adorable robot pets or human-like cyborgs, begin to seem absurd and dangerously inept for what is to come. We need to begin to think of AI not as a replacement for human intelligence and creativity, but as an augmentation it allows us to see patterns and imagine speculative futures that would be impossible for any one person to see on their own. Many artists are already co-authoring with AI to envision these divergent futures that expand our understanding of creative possibility. And of course, there are still new as yet undiscovered ways to collaborate with AI as an artistic medium. There are contradicting forces at play. In our present moment, much AI artwork is about, at the very minimum, the technology that produced it. But as AI continues to evolve, becoming an even more compelling collaborator or adversary to us in our creative process, 
It also increasingly accelerates the production of images, both moving and still, in an environment already saturated with cultural artifacts. A new generation of image viewers will grow up in a world where most of the images they encounter are AI generated. We can actually map out this moment of pictorial singularity. The 2022 research paper, Will We Run Out of ML Data, showed that there are between eight and 23 trillion images on the internet today, with the current yearly growth rate around 8%. If AI models generated in 2023 around 10 million images per year, I mean per day, this flippening could happen in just 30 years but either way, well within our lifetime. So it could be said that the nature of intelligence is very much so becoming more network-centric than human-centric. Metaphors have become essential vehicles for us as we begin to conceive of the power and nature of this technology. Sorry. As, as we continue to encounter these kinds of artworks, we might collectively learn how to understand, teach, and speak to these new kinds of intelligences so that we might collectively come to a better understanding and better relationship with the creativity of our future. Thank you. So I think we have some time for questions. We have uh, standing microphones uh, throughout the room. If you could go to the microphone to ask Ms. Geyer's questions, that way everyone in the room will be able to hear you. Hi. Um, as it stands, my understanding is that the way generative AI works is that it scrapes massive amounts of data um, from art that it can find on the internet without the permission or any um, or any um, payment to the artists whose work it is taking to learn from. And I know that there are a lot of opinions that suggest that generative AI, as such, is essentially theft because it's drawing from people who did not give permission for their art to be used in learning. Um, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? I, I definitely agree and understand that, that that is very much so how generative AI artworks are often like trained, or that's how generative AI is trained um, in terms of image modeling. Um, there have been some attempts, I know Holly Herndon, and Matt Dryhurst have created a system where perhaps like artists could upload their work um, in order to essentially put it into a database that says that my artwork, I, I do not want it to be trained as a part of the system. Um, and I, I believe that like that might be a really strong way forward, um, just because I do know that there are a lot of artists who operate in a little bit more of the creative commons lens and then don't mind the remixing and you know, reinterpretation of their works. That being said, some of the artists whose work I showed today um, also, you know, uses those small data sets and training repositories just on their own imagery, their own language, and their own works, which I think is ultimately a very effective way to, to create. Thank you. Thank you for your question. While others are getting up, I will take moderator's privilege and ask a question as well. Um, so I was especially struck by the first video you showed of the um, obvious inherent bias in the AI um, uh, mechanism that the artist was using, right? Do you feel hopeful that we'll ever be able to correct for that? Or do you think we are condemned to um, getting the best that we can, knowing that um, uh, it, that will fall short of the ideal. Mm. I tend to take 
a slightly more optimistic view. And I do think that it is the work of artists like Newf and like Stephanie Dinkins that point to our errors, you know, the errors of our ways, that may help to shed some light on where we do need to redirect um, or reframe uh, the continuation of this technology. Yeah. Helpful. Gracious. Hi, thank you. You showed a beautiful array of artwork that interacts with AI, and a lot of it, and maybe that's because of the presentation, um, is very visual. And I'm wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about where AI is interacting with um, uh, music and performing arts and um, some, other, uh, some of the other senses that are non-visual. I'm just very curious. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that is such a beautiful question. And I don't mean to keep bringing up Holly, but <laughs> Holly Herndon is a, a musical artist who has trained AI on her own voice. And then she's actually open sourced her voice as a collaborative effort so that others can use it as an instrument. So that's just one really creative example of, of music being integrated with AI. Cool. Hi, um, towards the end of your presentation, I know you stated that <clears throat> AI will not replace um, human art, but more kind of add on to it. Um, but I think there is kind of like, an undeniable presence of AI in the market of art. Um, when people are searching for graphic designers or illustrators or even VFX artists, um, I know that artists will continue to create art for the sake of art, but how do you foresee a change in the market of art in the future? This is a really strong question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that there is room, naturally so, um, we are always going to kind of have an affinity and appreciation for work that is created by the artist's hand. Um, so there is definitely, in my opinion, like room for the continued art market um, for what we would call like the plastic art, so sculpture, uh, painting, et cetera. Um, and there will be more room, so to speak, for new forms of new media artwork to coexist with AI, like Stephanie Dinkins' sculptural artwork. Um, is a really good example of that. Um, but part of what I was hoping to get across is this idea that artworks that use AI um, to help us understand the technology itself, um, artwork that gives us a speculative device to sort of begin to develop a metaphor or relationship with the technology is a really useful way to interpret and utilize AI. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It was beautiful. I was just wondering, I know there's various pre-processing techniques that are being used within the medical device industry to mitigate bias in um, algorithm predictions in surgical robotics, for example. And I was just wondering if you could speak to any tools that are being used or employed within the artistic community to mitigate bias. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I will have to give that one some thought and get back to you. I'm, I'm not like something doesn't come immediately to mind. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. interesting application. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Ms. Skyers generously said that she would be available if people wanted to speak with her after um, for individual conversations. Please join me in thanking her for a really fascinating. Thank you. Join us for lunch in the exhibition hall. Thank you.